Uh, today <coughs> is sponsored by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. It's part of our AIAA student chapter for the student club. Our chair for the club is Alex Holt. He's there. So he's actively looking for members. It's a young club, so please talk to him and become a member. Um, so, and this event is at AIAA Distinguished Lecture Series, and our distinguished speaker is Daryl Cummings. And Mr. Cummings is a recipient of the 2015 AIAA Aircraft Design Award, and to win that award, it's not an easy thing. So I've read Mr. Cummings' <coughs> nomination letter. It is 16 pages long, single-spaced, <laughs> very narrow margins. So I'm not going to be able to go over all that stuff. He's going to cover that in this presentation. But I'll give you a brief summary. Um, Mr. Cummings obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Engineering. Industrial Design. Industrial Design, sorry. Industrial Design. And his first two years was in Engineering and Science, and then the last three years was about arts and design. Yes. And after that, he spent 49 years in the aerospace industry working for very famous companies. And he retired from Boeing in 2004 as a technical fellow. And since then, he's been consulting to NASA, DARPA, U.S. Air Force, and several other <coughs> companies, and also giving a creativity workshop that we're going to do starting at 2 p.m. till 5. And if you haven't signed up, sorry, it's limited to 30, but <laughs> so I signed up. <laughs> All right. And Mr. Cummings retired from Boeing, and his last position was manager of the exploratory concepts group within Advanced Design and Phantom Works in Huntington Beach, California. Uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Cummings to Boise State. First of all, I want to tell you, I was I'm kind of shocked to get a call to come down here because I didn't know you had an error department down here, and I don't think you do, so uh, <laughs> quite an honor. And I forgot to introduce also Del Cummings' family is here, his son Kyle Cummings, his wife Karen Cummings is here, and his other son Scott. Scott is in the mechanical engineering program, and Kyle is in the computer science program, the dark side. So. <laughs> 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 Wow! <laughs> we had a discussion about that earlier. And, I was like, you know, you know, and I'm glad you did that because they said if I did it, I was going to be in big trouble. Right? So thank you very much. Anyway, I was kind of surprised to get an invitation because uh, I know you didn't have an error department. But uh, after we talked, I realized uh, it'd be probably pretty entertaining. And my family has never seen this presentation, so now they're apparently you get credit for showing up. So they get credit for showing up to listen to Dad talk, which is really awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I retired from uh, Boeing in 2004. The opening chart is kind of a collection of a couple things. The last project I had at the Boeing before I went out the door was the president of Phantom Works, uh, Bob Krieger, asked if I could design a flying car for him, and that's uh, shown right here. It's a coaxial rotor, a three-wheel flying car. He said, you know, if you're going out the door right before you go, design a flying car. I've always wanted to do a flying car. So um, I had a really good team design the flying car. And I had my artist put a flying over Coeur d'Alene. Uh, this is where we live right here. This is uh, Tubbs Hill where Karen and I hike almost every night. So this is my composite chart. Of, my, my dream of retirement is I actually owning my own flying car in Coeur d'Alene. The boys always say, where's my flying car? Well, there it is. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you a quick kind of overview of my background, and then we'll get into kind of meandering through my, my career. Um, I, I started out at what was called North American Aviation, which doesn't exist anymore. It became Rockwell, which doesn't exist anymore, which became part of Boeing. Uh, quick overview, projects at North American Aviation were uh, surprise fighter, one of the very, very first stealth airplanes. Uh, next project was the NGT, and I'll get in more detail on that. Um, went from there to Northrop, I uh, was chief, what they call configurator, and uh, he asked me to explain that. Uh, configurator is the guy who designs the whole airplane, the whole entire airplane. What does it look like? How does it go together? 
uh, every part. People, I tell people I design airplanes, they go, well, what part? I go, no, the whole thing. So that's what a configurator does. So my career in aerospace has been as a configurator in the whole airplane. Um, went from there back over to North American Aviation, which had become Rockwell by then, when North American Aircraft Division was chief engineer, chief designer, and sole patent holder on the Ranger 2000 program. Uh, we built three of those and tested them. And that, on that program, by the way, that's how I met my lovely wife. So I'm glad I had that program. So that was really, really interesting. Um, after that, uh, went on a program called the X40, which you may recognize this airplane as the X37, this secret spy airplane the Air Force sends up into orbit to do certain things. Uh, the precursor to that was the X40, uh, which I, I was in charge of designing that. That was a drop test vehicle to see if a vehicle that had all the aerodynamics of a giant potato could land on its own without <laughs> wadding itself up into a ball. Uh, next program was uh, multi-role endurance for the first UAVs for the U.S. Navy. This is one of the versions. Uh, the other versions are still classified. Uh, one of the last programs I worked on was Long Range Strike. This is a stealthy Mach 2 concept. Uh, it's sort of the precursor of the latest uh, Long Range Strike program that was uh, awarded uh, recently to the Northrop Company. Uh, this is a team I had on the flying car. We actually built an RC model of it right when I went out the door. And then uh, just last year, uh, we got this nice gold medal for Aircraft Design Award. Um, Boeing Technical Fellow 20, actually 30 patents as of this week, and won the um, Aircraft Design Award last year. Okay, where did I start? Well, um, as was pointed out, I actually took industrial design, so I didn't have training as a real airplane designer, but as a designer in general. So when I started North American, um, they were working on a, a program called FX, which became uh, the F-15 program. And I could sketch really well. So at back then, they didn't have computers. Everyone drew things by hand. So one of my first, first jobs was drawing up nifty fighter airplanes by hand when guys had these ideas. Like they had this thing about these rolling tips. If you look, each of these airplanes has a rolling tip. That, well, they could get a lot more performance out of a rolling tip. So I, these were actually drawings from 1968 uh, hand sketches. I was able to uh, hang on to it. So I learned how to design airplanes really by drawing and working with the guys. This was the actual proposal airplane from North American, which even today to me looks really, really modern. It had the blended wing on it, lower inlet, a really nice airplane. Um, this airplane actually kind of looks like the F-16 XL, which was done in 1982. So that's really, I got my start in the group, configuration group as kind of an artist and sketching and helping with airplanes and also uh, kind of a pencil for some of the other ones. Uh, they lost the FX airplane, so they said, well, what are we going to do with all the designers? So, well, let's, let's design a, a large civil transport that takes off vertically. What they wanted to do is, rather than build a bunch of new runways, could we build a large transport airplane that took off uh, vertically and then flew efficiently horizontally? And this was a design. What's interesting is uh, we use these uh, dedicated the lift fans, which closed off. And then we had these tilting uh, fans that tilted back for vertical takeoff and then forward. And it's really exactly the same system that's on the F-35 now. So this was back in about 1969. Um, we went from there to doing uh, B-1 bombers and other things. But the point I mean, we had very different jobs from even week to week, month to month. You might be working on a, a fighter plane one week and a bomber one week. And the next month, you might be doing a civilian transport. So it was really, really a lot of fun. Next big program I was on, uh, since I was a relatively new guy, that uh, Rockwell had won the B-1 program. And the Air Force said, you know, is there a way we can make the bomber simpler but not with a swing wing and have kind of the same performance? So Rockwell didn't want to change. So they took the new guy, myself, and a new air and says, you guys go up design a fixed wing bomber because we know you won't be able to do a good job as a swing wing. And we really worked and worked and worked and they were starting to close in terms of performance and got about that close and they cut the program off. Uh, they, they canceled our work. It was getting way too good. So that was my first <laughs> on the board project at Rockwell. It was because they knew I couldn't do the job. And unfortunately, we did. Uh, next project, this was really interesting. There was a, a, a Russian document that had come out in the early 70s about, um, it's called specular returns. That's where you made these real flat 
size so the radar would come in and, and glance off and not come back, which happens on anything that's round. So uh, they asked me, they said, well, could you design a, a, a specular return airplane? And I designed this thing called the Surprise Fighter in 1973. And as you can see from the cross-section, it has all, all flat sides and they, they slope inwards. And what was interesting back in 73, it wasn't classified. So we were testing this right out in a farmer's field, right around right the main street in L.A. I mean, these photos were, I, I took these photos just driving by in the street. So here all the secret stealth technology was being tested right out the street. Now what's really funny is that, that Rockwell really didn't believe there was a future in stealth. Boy, were they wrong. So this, I was told later by Dan Raymer that this model, which was about 15 feet long, wound up in the Rockwell salvage store, and I actually could have bought the very first stealth fighter mock at the, if I got the salvage store in time. So anyway, great project. Okay, next project. We, we, talked about this story earlier. This was the first project I got involved in where it was all 100% my design competing internally for a contract. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, there was, we have these sacred designers, guys that have been in North America for like you know, 40 years. They always got the plum project for really fun things. Well, we have this program from the Air Force called Advanced Fighter Technology Integration. And they wanted to combine kind of a jet flap and some canards and a bunch of other things for this maximum maneuverability. And I, I thought I had some pretty good designs, but I, I never could win against the senior designers. So uh, my roommate at the time and I hatched up a scheme where I would submit this design, which I thought was pretty good, under a fake name. And he told the story. So I put a fake name on the drawing, put it in the competition. No one knew who it was. So it, it went through all the analysis along with the other one that I won. And then they tried to figure out who this guy was. They thought he was from another division of the company. And they found out it was me. They were pretty upset about it. But they gave me chief engineer and chief designer on the program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually had it as a code name. It was FF Brothers. We had, we had pencils made with a name on We had a desk. We had drawings. We had a nameplate. FF Brothers. The, the head of the program came around looking for him. He said, what do you want? I want to meet this guy. So he went in the configuration area and he said, oh, he, he was right here. He's over in the aero group. He told us that with the aero groups, you just missed him. He's over in structure. <laughs> After about three of those, he goes, okay, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> we confessed. He said, I, he'd have never won the contest because he knew he was a new guy. So we came up with a fake name. He says, you know, ballsy move. You're chief engineer. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the Air Force did in the end was stick a couple chin fins on an F-16 and call it after. But what, what they did do, they came back and said, well, what if you made a UAV, an unmanned air vehicle, that had all these components you were talking about, and we could make it modular. And we could drop it off a B-52, and we could try jet flaps and forward swept wing and these rolling wing tips, uh, flat decks, and all these really nifty things. So... Uh, we, we bid on that. Uh, actually, this wasn't mine. I can't take credit for the final design. It wasn't mine. It started with this one, and then I went off on something. I went off on the NGT, and someone else did this. But uh, there's one of these at the National Air and Space Museum, and unfortunately, they only built uh, the original configuration. They didn't test all these other things. <laughs> they found out it was so expensive to put it up in the B-52 and launch it and track it and everything. And the tests were causing millions and millions of dollars for each test. So they realized in the end they'd have been better off just probably building a little bit there, putting landing gear on the lesson board. Uh, oh, first airborne laser. This is interesting. While I was working there, a guy in the group, electronics guy, came in and he said, I got this really cool idea to put a laser on an airplane. This is back in 1976. And he says, can you draw airplanes? You draw airplanes. Can you draw an airplane and fit this thing in? So I made a bomber and a fighter that incorporated this uh, rolling lens system with a laser in it. And we applied for it in 1976. And what happened, the uh, patent department, when they get something like that, they actually have to send it to a defense agency. And they sent it to the Secretary of the Air Force said, well, we, we, can't, we can't let this public go public. So they held it for five years. And it wasn't issued uh, until 1981. So it was seminal. It was the very first patent ever on um, an airborne laser in 1976. So anyway. I can't take credit for the electronic part, I just did the airplane part, but since I did the airplane, he did electric, I had half the credit. It's kind of Got Pat. Oh, oh, oh. 
do run? Okay. So uh, the next project, this is one I actually started. Um, the president of the company, Buzz Lowe, came down to the advanced design group and said, uh, hey, we need something new to work on. We won the B1. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't get the AFTI thing. What should we do, be doing? So I thought, well, you know, the, the Air Force really needs to replace their old T-37 T trainer, and Heritage North American had built more trainers than anybody in the world. We, we should be doing that. I would like to go down to Air Training Command and ask them what they want. We'll design their airplane with them. So I went down to Air Training Command, and uh, they said, well, we liked our side-by-side our -side seating, but we want these uh, zero, 0 ejection seats, which means I can be sitting on the runway if there's a fire in the airplane. I can pull it and get out. Uh, the seats then wouldn't work that way. Uh, they wanted it pressurized in air conditioning. The T-37s were, they were not pressurized. They could only fly to 10,000 feet. And on the runway, we actually went down and measured the temperature in the cockpit on the runway. It was 120 degrees sitting on the runway of Texas. So they wanted air conditioning. They liked the low wing. And I said, why? I said, well, believe it or not, pilots, student pilots, every once in a while, landed with a landing gear up. So it's nice to have this structure. Under us. But the thing we'd really, really like is the engines mounted on pods like a business jet so we can get to them better. The current T-37 is really, really hard to get to. Yeah. Uh, this will be a little part of the creativity workshop, so I'm, I'll go through it pretty quickly. So there was the original T-37. Uh, the engines are really buried in the structure, very hard to get to, hard to maintain. Uh, but they wanted the same thing, like I said. They wanted the side-by-side -side seating, they wanted low wing, but they wanted potted engines. So we went back and we designed the absolute, absolute ideal Air Force fan. And it was fabulous. It had this big canopy, it was air conditioned, had side by side, had the potted engines. It was really great until we went to the wind tunnel. When we got the wind tunnel, we found that the thing it needed to do most was go up and do stalls and spins. The very thing it needed to do the most, right as it got up the stall, would, would, would put a very bad vortex right in the engine airplane install and fall out of the sky, which is really not good for a trainer. <laughs> so we went back to Air Training Command and said, well, rather than saying you want potted engines, why don't you tell us functionality? And they said, well, we want the engines at chest height for easy maintenance, a large door for easy access, uh, what's called a horizontal monitor structure or pylon on a jet. So if we want to change from a, a turbo jet to a more efficient turbo fan to an ion transfer engine, we can just put it on a pylon. And the main thing was that the nacelle or the intake is not part of the primary structure. In other words, it can be removed without damaging the primary structure. So uh, we came up with this thing. We came up with thing called a conformal nacelle, which is right here. So the whole airplane structure was autonomous without the nacelle. So you could put any kind of engine you want. You could actually drop this as a glider, and it would fly. And you can see they, they could walk up and maintain it. And we built this really, really nice mock-up. They actually built it rather cheaply out of uh, spare materials up in, at, at Palmdale. In fact, this was in uh, Aviation Week, and I got a call from a friend of mine at Northrop, and he said, Daryl, I like your airplane, but uh, your landing gear doors are too long. Uh, when your landing gear compresses, the doors are going to hit the ground. And I said, well, these are just a pair of iron posts, and that's just a piece of plywood. And he said, oh, no. He says, I can tell a real airplane when I see it. That's a real airplane. I go, no, it's, it's just foam and fire. That's just a piece of plywood we paint white. He said, no, no, no. I said, okay, but I said, yeah, it's a real airplane. We found it. We'll fix it. So, <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, we went a little, a little further around the airplane. We had to stretch it a little bit. Uh, turns out for good spin recovery, it needed to be a little bit longer. We went into the NASA spin tunnel. This is actual photos from the NASA spin tunnel. It was so good. It was so fantastic. They said, can we keep the model? I never got the model. I really wanted that model. I said, we want to keep it. Everyone that comes in here, their airplane has got to be as good as this airplane. So we have the airplane. The Air Force loved it. They helped design it, had the best spin stall of any airplane on the planet. But we lost the competition. Uh, we lost it to uh, this really ugly airplane. <laughs> it's officially known as the Thunder Pig. <laughs> Anyway, this was, it was built by a company called Fairchild, which was in New York. Uh, Senator Dabo was the head of the U.S. Budget Committee and basically said, if you don't buy this airplane for Fairchild and keep it in business, I'm going to shut the government down. So 
The Air Force called the Air Training Command and said, can you live with this airplane? They said, well, we can live with it, but, I mean, it, 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 it's so draggy. It's got all this stuff so draggy and underperforming. In fact, even the Garrett Company, which was supposed to supply the engines, they asked for 1,100 pounds of thrust for each engine. They gave them 1,600 pounds each because their guys had estimated it had at least 40% more drag. And at full throttle with 50% more thrust, they could barely make cruise speed. It was, it was a terrible outcome. Uh, anyways, so we lost to this thing. They picked it and they built three airplanes and uh, the price doubled in about a year and the thing could barely get out of its own way. Uh, so that they canceled the program. What was funny was the Air Force Museum refused to have one on display for 30 years. And they had to go through about four different directors and they're finally restoring one now after you know, almost 40 years. Now, you're probably saying, well, Daryl, why, why are you so upset? And I said, well, believe it or not, it's not because it was a really good design and I was really upset. It was my first thing with politics and I was the chief engineer and chief designer. The reason I'm really upset was Buzz Lowe, the president of the company, about June of 82, right before they were going to announce, called me in his office and said, I think we've got this one. We've got the best airplane. The Air Force Bluff said it's an airplane. You, you brought the program up. You designed it. What do you want out of it personally? <laughs> My wife hates this story. I said, all I want is a bronze bust of myself out in front of the building that says Daryl Becoming's designer of it. The, the Nova Trainer. He said, we win this and we build these. I'll get you your bronze press. So I'm upset because I didn't get my bronze press. <laughs> <laughs> really upset. I wanted that bronze press. Really bad. Okay. Uh, okay. So we lost that. I was really upset. I've had a standing offer to join uh, the Northrop Company to work on a project. I described. Uh, Bob Sandusky said, hey, when you're done fooling around with that stupid, you know, Rockwell company, come over to North. We got a project for you. I can't tell you what it is, but you'll love doing it. So I left in August of 82, found out they had to get a secret clearance, then a top secret clearance, and then a top secret clearance with special access. Anyway, I finally got it, and he said, okay, your job is to design the next stealthy Air Force fighter. That's a cool job. So I have a little uh, quickie description of kind of the evolution of that airplane. This is the actual airplane. Uh, there's the first flight in uh, 1990. I was a chief configurator on that. I was not chief engineer. Chief engineer had a responsibility for the airplane. Mine was just the actual design of the, the physical part of the airplane. This is kind of how it evolved. This was kind of a, an early design uh, that they were working on when I got there. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but one of the things, this had a B2 style wing with a kind of the razor tip. And since we're getting a side spike here, I realized we could clip the wings and just cleaned it up, cleaned it up, and I was telling some of the students, the thing that set the wingspan was it had to fit in a tab V shelter. So we only had so much wingspan. And the way we decided to get performance was with low wing loading and high thrust to weight. So we just kept adding more and more of a wing area within the span. That's why I wound up with called the clip diamond. And if you notice, the, the tails are very, very big. What most people don't know, it's actually a tandem wing airplane. The rear tails actually produce lift. And uh, when the generals came to see the mock, I found actually on the wall, I had them bring in a wing off an F5, and I took a piece of tape, black tape, and showed them how much bigger the tail was than the Y.3 than the wing off a of current F5 fighter. Blue away, it's a huge, huge tail. Anyway, this is one of the first wind tunnel models. Um, this design I did in 83. By the way, DP is kind of funny. We had, we were in an isolated building, no windows, uh, fake badges. We were some hardware company. It was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> And my boss said, well, you can come up with a numbering system because we're not connected to Northrop. So I came up with a DP series. And he said, what does that mean? I said, Daryl's project. And he goes, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so no one else thought that. So and we went through a series of designs. And then one of the funniest things is, well, he says, what is the absolute stealthiest airplane you can do? Because this one actually, where it's flat, has a, what they call a side spike. So I said, he said, I think it's impossible to design a fighter without a side spike. And of course, anyone's saying it's impossible, that's my challenge. So I came up with this thing called Christmas tree. Uh, it actually has no side spike at all. They're all angled all the way along. And uh, actually, before, they didn't test it before I left the company. I went back to Rockwell. And I said, I think it's a really nifty airplane, but I think it'll be totally unstable after about 
10 degrees angle of attack will just flip out of the sky and kill the pilot. So they tested the tunnel, sure enough, right at 10 degrees, it just went totally unstable and fell out of the sky. But it didn't have side spike because he said you can't do one without side spike. And I did it. It wasn't any good. But <laughs> anyway, that was the last project I did for them. And then uh, I was at uh, AIAA, functioned at Cal Poly Slow at a student review, and the chief scientist from Rockwell said, hey, would you like to come back to Rockwell because, you know, they canceled the NGT program, so now they got to start it all over again, and you have more experience, would you like, oh, no, sorry, I, I forgot I had a slide, I, I'll just skip. Now, people ask me about uh, between the YF-22 and the YF-23, which was better. This is the one that won uh, on the left, the 22, uh, made by Lockheed. This is the YF-23. Here they are together. You can see they're kind of different velocity. This is more like an F-15. It was kind of more of a dogfighter, had more had thrust vectoring, which is not very good for stealth. Uh, ours was more stealthy and better in super cruise. In fact, all the, all the data showed that we were better in every way. Unfortunately, uh, right about that time, late 1990, Northrop was being investigated for fraud on this program called Tacit Rainbow. Uh, they were, I think, $4 billion into the program that hadn't even built a single airplane. <laughs> Uh, they were best, and, and the V-2 was overrun, and the contract was awarded a few months after that. So if I were the Air Force or Congress, I'd, I'd have given it to Lockheed, too. Uh, what's interesting, we were talking about growth and weight. Uh, the original ATF goal was 50,000 pounds and $35 million and 750 aircraft. And, of course, Congress goes, well, let's buy fewer airplanes so we can save money. Well, you have to amortize the cost of the tooling. Whether it's one airplane or 750, you've got to amortize, so the cost kept going up. So they reduced the buy to 195, and it went up to 195 million dollars a copy. So it became a very like the B2. I mean, Congress says, well, just if they're that much, just cut to a off. Well, they still have to amortize the tooling. So if you want to buy one, it's 25 trillion dollars. <laughs> so I got I forgot I had this slide because I had so many questions last time. Getting ahead of myself. I am getting ahead of myself. Uh, one of the other things uh, I had to do in the program was because the airplane sustained nine G's, we actually had to design a new flight suit because there was no flight suit at the time capable of a pilot sustaining nine G's while uh, blacking out. So we designed a whole new thing called an uh, aircrew protection system. It had positive pressure breathing, blood pumping from the legs, and we threw in a helmet that had uh, laser protection, chem bio protection, it had everything. Uh, if the pilot went in the water, it had a Thing called sea wars, where it hit sea water and a vest came out. It was pretty fantastic. Uh, actually, I got a, uh, with the team, we got a patent on that. Got put in the Northrop on a roll of inventors. But what's interesting, we lost the program with the Air Force. It actually continued on with the flight suit. A lot of the pieces are used in the current MC. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, went back, D 37 program, still going on because the Fairchild fiasco. Uh, the pilots. Said, hey, you know, this thing converts fuel to noise. I think about <laughs> half, if not two thirds, of the instructor pilots were deaf in at least one year. Uh, 120 degrees sitting in this thing. Uh, the Navy decided to go in on it too. They had this thing called the T-34C. It was even worse than this. You actually had to bail out. You had to roll a, roll a, like a John Wayne movie. You had to roll a canopy bag and jump out over the side. <laughs> so pretty archaic. The two very archaic airplanes. Um, so we, we wound up actually. Uh, teaming with the Germans on because they had this program called Euro NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training, so we felt it'd be better to form a, a, a company and with, at the time it's called DAS, it's not called Airbus. Uh, I was chief designer, chief engineer, in fact, sole patent holder on it. That's the patent for this is the airplanes, the one of three we built. And I think I say it on another slide, but if I don't want them, it's in the uh, Tulsa Aerospace Museum, and they were actually kind enough, I didn't know that, that they put invented by Daryl B. Cummings on it, which is really neat go to the museum or the wife goes to the museum and they treat her like a star. <laughs> anyway. um, also, kind of going back to my art stuff, uh, we had a, a contest internally to do a paint scheme for the, uh, if you look back, you'll see that's the paint scheme on the airplane. Uh, so I, I won the paint scheme contest and made a real nice model, one of a kind model and stand. And then they had a contest for the first flight patch and I won that one too. So. That's actually on the jacket that's in the museum. Uh, flight testing, 
really looked good. There were uh, about seven competitors in this article from Aviation Week. June 5th, Ranger 2000, which was the name of the airplane, was tops. We beat everybody. Man, we had the airplane to win. Sound familiar? And uh, sure enough, we lost. Uh, <laughs> they went out and said, what's the cheapest airplane you can buy? I said, well, it's a prop PC-9 made in Switzerland. With uh, notice how it's what bumped right up behind it to bump it up because the, the rear pilot had to see 10 degrees over the front pilot, and that airplane was zero. So they put this big ugly canopy on to meet all the requirements. And by the way, I was telling you, my wife is the worst, best, the best worst case seven female pilot in the Air Force. She was the standard for how bad it was to fit a person in an airplane. So she became the, the standard of all the entire Air Force. <laughs> she was the smallest, not bad. I had to accommodate the smallest. She was the, the smallest largest. she had to accommodate, which was very hard. <laughs> By the way, everything you do was just going up and down. See, we had to have 12 inches of rudder pedal adjustment. So she wound up being strapped in the airplane and testing all the rest, and got strapped into a Russian ejection seat. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is it at the museum, and uh, they were, like I said, kind enough. I, this was, I didn't ask, they put Daryl be kind of in there. That's kind of neat. Uh, okay, I, I'm just other projects now. Um, after that, kind of didn't have anything to do. They said, hey, could you design a vertical takeoff UAV? That seems to be a popular thing. This is back in 95. So I came up with a uh, uh, tilting ducted. It looks like an airplane here. Looks like a robot there, I guess. Uh, anyway, we built them all. It worked really fine, and they lost interest on it. So nothing happened. I got a pad now. It was kind of neat. There's the... On it. Yeah, we, we actually built through the model. It's kind of neat. It's a typical Boeing. They lost interest right away. They just bought uh, in situ instead. They said, well, they're already building UAVs. We'll just buy that company. So they stopped doing this. Next program I worked on, I got a call from a guy, uh, a guy named John Fuller. He says, hey, we're working on this um, program. It's actually called SMD at the time, Space Maneuver Vehicle. If you recognize it, that's here. This is a, this big secret DARPA space plane you hear about. This was the precursor to it. He said, I, 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 I got a problem. I got to, I got to start from a, a clean factory floor and have this airplane roll out in nine months. Can you do it? And I said, well, I can do it. There's got to be certain rules. You know, you got to do it a certain way. The vendors can't be very far away and whatever. But I think we can get it done. It's not really a problem. So um, the job was, uh, what, what we did, there were several space plane people proposed, Lockheed and Orbital and Boeing. And what Boeing did was they said, look, if you'll give us basically, I think it was five million, we'll throw in five million, we'll build you a drop vehicle and demonstrate, you know, this thing that's like a rock can actually land all by itself, hands off, and not walk itself up into a ball. And it was dropped from a, a helicopter. You can see it's on the strap. I actually designed this hard pack and the system and it had a little explosive cutter and it dropped and it just flew down and landed all by itself. First time ever done. Uh, anyway, we won that, and that led right to the award of the, um, the X-37. This is actually building it. We actually have the mold made in a, in a boat maker shop. Turns out they're very good at making molds for things about this size. So we went to a boat shop down in, uh, in the South Bay area, and they built the molds. And uh, we had all these access panels because we had all kinds of electronics. And we had to have these emergency parachutes in, in case I which cracks me up. It's still, the wings are like postage stamps on a brick. It's not going to go anywhere. So I said, well, you know, what if it flies over to California from New Mexico? So I had to put these huge parachutes on it, you know, that we could press and pop the parachutes out. So we had these huge, and then we had, you can see these airbags on the bottom. So if everything went to hell, we could pull the chutes and it would come down and land on the airbag. And we could save the airplane because we only built one, which is very unusual. So a really good program. Um, I did the paint scheme in the patch for that too. It's kind of cool. Took out this really neat model. Kind of keep the patch. Um, I'm going to tell a little story on this. I do this in a creativity workshop too. But we had, one of the areas we had a real problem was on landing gear. There was only a certain space the landing gear could fit into. Uh, so we went to the B1 landing gear guy to design it. Uh, but, the, but the problem was uh, he came up with this solution that was more expensive than the whole program and took longer than we had in the program. So I went over to him, use these methods we're going to do in the creative community workshop, and I said, George, I said, if this is not for the B1, 
I said, this is for an unmanned vehicle. If it, if it lands and it bounces, no one's going to care. As long as it doesn't wad itself up in the ball and lose $10 million in one shot, don't care. Uh, you can leave the landing gear doors off. They're on this picture. It's a later flight. But if you looked at it up from the bottom, it was all black. With the landing gear doors on, it had a lift to drag of two and a half. With the landing gear doors off, it had a lift to drag of two and a half. Didn't make any difference. I mean, on or off, didn't make any difference. So there's no risk of the doors jamming or anything like that. And I said, you're the only person I have these skills to do that. I mean, up floating around in your head are orifices, O-rings, coefficient of friction, plating, brakes, and all that. You're the only guy I can do. you got to help me out. And I, what I said is, I go home tonight and, and think about it and, and see if you can come up with a solution. And George, being a very nice guy, says, you know what, Daryl, you're a nice guy, but you're full of this thing going to happen. And the good thing was, he came, he called me the next morning. He says, I can't believe it. He said, I thought I gave myself the assignment for my own sleep. He reduced the part, I mean, by 50%, simplified design, simplified manufacturing. Um, went right into the airplane, and we had a successful flight. And uh, they made the cover of eight week. And uh, that was it. We wiped out the competition we won because we, we flew and we did the hard part. And uh, this is the back end of the airplane. That's, they allowed me to sign my name on the back of the airplane for display at Wright Field. So, so that was the second airplane I got in the museum. And, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, and then, uh, because, because we just won a mega billion dollar program, uh, Boeing thought it would be appropriate to make me a tech fellow, which is kind of neat. And Karen got to go to the ceremony with me. It was quite nice. Tuxedo and a nice gold medal and all that stuff. It's kind of cool. Anyway, the airplane's at the right Patterson Museum. Uh, they said they were only going to fly it once. They wound up flying it, I think, I think next year, like seven or eight times. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was really amazing. They just kept flying it, flying it, flying it. <coughs> I think they wanted to see if it would actually crash. It never did. Um, right after that, we got a call from Seattle saying, hey, we want to do a supersonic business jet. Uh, we'd like to do one with a swing wing on it. We did one way back when in the 70s. You, we know you did the, the V1. Could you draw up a uh, supersonic business jet? So I literally took the V1 wing and just literally just scaled it and stuck it on it. A piece of life called the Saber Cat. Uh, cheated a little bit, used an all moving VTL from the YF 23, 2D nozzles from the YF 22, so we could uh, maybe reduce the size of the tail. Kind of a neat airplane, but it was one of those you drive, you send it to, and it goes in a black hole and never hear about it again. Uh, next program I worked on was called the Multi Role Endurance. It was the uh, first uh, kind of unmanned program the Navy had. This is the only picture I can show. This is kind of conventional. We did some ETOL versions that were stealthy that are still classified today. But really, really nifty airplane, kind of fit the same space as the T-45 trainer. Uh, took off, had really long endurance, had a, you know, had a satellite dish and sensors. And what they were going to do is the Navy wanted to have what they called organic uh, ISR, which is, you know, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. And they didn't have it. They had to call the Air Force for it. So they said, hey, you know, could you design something we could carry with us on the on the carriers, and we could have our own organic ISR. Like I said, that led to the uh, what's now called the UCAP program. So that was, that was a neat program. I'd like to show you the design. They're still classified today. If you can imagine. Well, it's a stealthy VTOL coming kind of like, uh, 35. Um, next program was Long Range Strike, which actually the latest program is at, uh, uh, the one that uh, Northrop just won. Um, these were no a couple of notional designs. We had to do hypersonic. Subsonic, we actually did things like uh, Boeing 747s full of about 100 cruise missiles and C-17s full of cruise missiles. Subsonic, stealthy, and this is, this is the only one they released. This is a, a, a Mach 2 stealthy airplane they did back then. Uh, what's interesting is happened right, this is the next chart. It happened kind of right about when 9-11 happened. So very interesting time for designing these international stealthy strike things and uh, the Twin Towers go up. Very, very interesting times in the industry. Uh, next project after that was thing called uh, Strike Tanker. Uh, the Air Force wanted a, a stealthy tanker that could fly along with the stealthy B-2 and the stealthy F-22 and then refuel it because if the tanker's out there and he lights up the sky for 500 miles, it's, they know right where the stealthy airplane is. They just come and shoot them <laughs> off the back. So we came up with this um, 
stealthy uh, tank for transport. Actually, we came up with such a novel propulsion system, we got a, uh, a patent on the propulsion system. Our program never really went anywhere. It, it was just too single purpose, and uh, they just felt just converting 767s into tankers. Um, we were talking about site tech. I, I, I decided to put kind of some other stories of different things that just happened. Um, in SciTech in January 2003, I was working for a guy named John Zuck um, at, in NASA Aeronautics, and they had a, a program called um, the East Hall Extremely Short Takeoff and Landing. And they had, I think it was a series of about seven different programs, and they were supposed to have these what they call sizzling concepts, so they could do posters. And the sizzling concept that, uh, unfortunately, Cal Poly students did it, was this, and it looked exactly like a B, BAE 146. So they said, well, how is this sizzling? And Rich Wellesian, who was running the program, told John Zuck at the meeting, he said, if you don't come up with a new design in an hour, I'm going to cancel your funding. So he comes running into the room, and uh, he says, Daryl, you got one hour to come up with a new airplane, sketch it. Scale it out, and I take it back to Wells and save the program. So this was an airplane. I came. I said, "Man, it's got to be really wild. Going to have propulsion up here, and these are going to flow down and give a train flow over the wing. And you know, I'm going to uh, put a V-tail thrust vectoring APU." And he couldn't get more weird. And he ran back into Wells and Wells and said, "Okay, you're funded. You can do that. You can do it." Uh, I was still working for Boeing at the time, and they liked it so much they gave me a on. <laughs> I, I wanted to tell it because they're, they're not just start at point A and point B. There's a lot of these paths that wander around. Anyway, John Zuck was a good friend of mine for a long time after that. I saved all this, saved this program for him. Um, last program at uh, Boeing, like I said, was the flying car program. Uh, Bob Krieger called me up and said, hey, I understand you're retiring. I want you to do a flying car for me. So I had this team, a really, really brilliant team of guys who put together this coaxial rotor. The rotor's actually folded back and stowed. Uh, took off vertically, take off from your home, fly work. It was really, really cool. Came really close to building it. said, that's really neat. Can you go out and give me a quote to build one? Went out, got a quote to build one. You remember this story. I'm sitting in the room, about ready to get a check written to me for you know, 20 million bucks. Find out we just that day bought Frontier Systems, which was building helicopters. They said, well, we can't have competing design. So that, ah, that check just got Oh. <laughs> anyway, we, anyway, I didn't get my flying car. I was that close. I mean, a day earlier, I might have to check my hand around. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, that was, I have a bunch of projects that I consult. I really can't get into them. Actually, most of them are um, proprietary. They do work for people. The ones that aren't proprietary, this is that first uh, stealthy morphing wing I did right after I retired. I did this thing called uh, V-Star. It's a vertical takeoff cargo resupply. Operates off Navy aircraft. Uh, this is a, a dual use thing I did. Uh, this was in Aviation Week. This is actually the, this is a, uh, basically a turbo shaft engine driving generators. And the wing is split. And there's a whole series of fans in the wing. And it's extremely quiet. And what we did, we did a joint project between uh, the Air Force Research Lab and NASA. Could you do one airplane that would could have a deck on the back and be a transport, or converted with windows to be a commercial airline, and then that's what we did. Uh, right, I'm working on most stuff. I'm working on is classified. This is the only one I'm working on a NASA program, looking at new kind of commercial airplanes for the 2030s. We've got about 12 designs, and as I told you, I'm working back and forth right now between MIT, NASA, Aurora, and some others. So. Um, I did have a break in the middle. Uh, from 2007 to 2010, I was chief engineer on a darker rapid eye program. It's classified. There's no public images, but I can tell you uh, it was a really simple program. It was to take a, uh, a used Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missile, remove the nuclear warhead, replace it with a nose cone, and inside of a little unmanned air vehicle that would pop out and spy over China or North Korea. And, uh, I told the program manager, I said, you realize if North Korea sees an ICBM coming at them, they aren't going to know the difference whether it has a little airplane in the nose or a thermonuclear weapon. And then he says, oh, we're just going to call them and tell them. Oh, don't worry. It's just a little airplane that's going to pop out. So. <laughs>
Now the other thing was when you press the button for it to go, when you press the button, it was somewhere between 50 and, 7, 50 and 70 million dollars per launch. So not only could if you start at World War III very easily, but it was very expensive to start World War III. <laughs> Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed, and, uh, and that program was canceled. So I have, I, I'm working on, I'd say 80% of the stuff I'm working on now is kind of classified, and it, it's really fun, and it's going to be a real game changer. So I think that's about where I'm done. So uh, if you have any questions, did I make it on time? Oh, right on time. I said 45 minutes. Yeah. yeah, if you have questions, if not, uh, well, let's, sure up. let's give Mr. Cummings a... Questions? Well, I get credit for coming. That's good question. Oh, what is SciTech? Oh, uh, scientific technology. It's a meeting every January at the LA House where they bring all the, all the disciplines come in from all over the world. And uh, the, the big joke is, boy, one good weapon you can take out aerospace. And, and, uh, but, but it's 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 really it's it's kind of like Gamblers Anonymous. I mean, all the these guys meet there and say, "Would you like to work on this? What are you working on?" And, hey, I got this. Like motto, hey, I got this stuff. If you put on your airplane, you can change the world. You know, that kind of stuff. It's, it's where all the airplane. And, and Space Twinkies meet <laughs> at the same time. And there's a lot. They have, they have a Space One and they have an aviation. But it's where all the aerospace community. And they have seven solid days of presentations. And it's got to be 100 a day at least. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I mean every, every, you know, computational fluid dynamics, flow control, uh, wind turbine design, uh, CFD, and just, <coughs> just everything in the industry. And, and you can just pick which ones you want to go to. And then most of the business, as you know, is done in the evening for dinner. You know, the, hey, would you like to come over and design this for me? And, you know, I got this thing going on. So it's, yeah. Okay. Are there questions? No? No. Oh. All right, let's have one. <laughs> um, did you know when you went into engineering that you wanted to work on airplanes, helicopters, or did you kind of fall into it after school? Oh. <laughs> Do you have time for that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, and my degree is actually industrial design. I, I kind of want to be a car designer, really, but that's a long story. But I'll do the short version of it. Uh, North American Aviation graduate. When I graduated from high school, they were desperate for draftsmen. I mean, they they were everything was done by hand, and drafting really is kind of an art. I mean, to do it well. And so I uh, I just got out of school. I didn't have a college degree, and I said, well, we'll give you a two week trial, and if you make it. Well, hire you, and they, they love, it's a long story, but they love my stuff. So they hired me every summer, and so I kind of got the airplane stuff by osmosis while I was there. And then, and I told you the long version of the story, but the short version of the story was, I had a choice to work in LA in aerospace, or in Fort Wayne, Indiana, or Detroit on, on cars. And growing up in LA, they, they just weren't good choices, so I went the airplane route, and uh, it was mostly on-the-job training because back then it was really more of a journeyman type thing. You, you sat by an experienced designer and stuff. I laid out airfoils by hand one point at a time. And, you know, and then, oh, didn't I tell you I want three degrees to twist the wing and start over? Oh, <laughs> but, but you get a feel. I mean, you get a really good feel. And in the end, really, uh, and I hate to say this, but the, really the configurators are mostly their artists. They're, they're kind of have a feel for the whole airplane because one of the guys who started with me, Doug Robinson, he, he did his whole four years of school. That's all he wanted to do was a configurator. And he got in there and he got the job, and he was there two years, and they said, we can either fire you or you can go into analysis. But you don't have the feel. You know, the, the feel. It's, configurators really have to have the whole airplane in their head. The propulsion, the wings, the tails, the landing gear, the weapons, the fuel system, all kind of juggled in their head. And we were talking about it's really energy management. It's just Air coming in, and what happens to it when it goes over the airplane? Does it flow smoothly? Is it converted into forward thrust easily, efficiently? You know, that kind of, it's just energy management. And it's, you know, you asked me, is it up my head? I said, I'm always seeing it up my head. Except for this last one. I had to build a model of I couldn't, it was so weird, I couldn't do it. I have a project I'm working on I can't talk about, but it's the weirdest airplane. I'll talk about it. No, no, it's, <laughs> it, is, it is so weird. 
I drew a three view of it, and I still couldn't tell what it looked like. Uh, it was it was all three views looked like one looked like a soda can, and the top view looked like a you know a stapler, and the third one looked like a pumpkin. I mean, <laughs> so I had to build a model, and, and yet as I rotate the model and photograph, every view looked different. And I sent it to the guy, and he goes, "Oh, well, this is great. We got to go talk to Deborah Jane, secretary there." For <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a long game, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a question about the models. So you, you were building a lot of models and like taking into the spin uh, yeah. tunnel and stuff mm -hmm. like that. How did you scale it like weight wise, dimension wise, like how big were you, how big were they and like how detailed were these models? Um, they can dynamically scale them or I think they call them mass scale. It's, you have to pick one. Um, normally they're, they're picked for certain either to represent the way the mass is distributed, the inertia, or the way the aerodynamics done by what they call Reynolds number. Uh, most, most of the ones, if you have a, what they call a diagnostic tunnel, just see if it's going to fly. Sometimes they can be this small, like I was talking about on the X40. When I came in, they had a design. I looked at it and I said, at 20 degrees angle of attack, that thing's going to fall out of the sky. And he goes, how do you know? I said, I'm just I'm telling you, I'm looking at it. So they built a tunnel with 20, 19, 20 degrees tailwind, unstable, and fell out of the sky. But, you just get a feeling for it. But in terms of models, usually the more detailed data you want, the bigger the scale has to be. And the more, and, and, you know, you have to match the solidity, like, you know, if you want the wing to flex, you know, like in real life, if you do, it's got to be built out of, say, composite material. Or most of them are built out of stainless steel, because they have to have all these sensors all over them that measure pressure differential and temperature and that. Actually, it's really interesting, one of my best configurators came from the wind tunnel model group. He came over when I was on YF23. And he said, Daryl, this, this stuff you're working on is so much fun. Can I do it? And I said, if you want to do it, you can do it. Because if you've done wind tunnel models, which are very complex, you understand. And he'd be, he'd be kind of fabulous configurator. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, so <laughs> how big was the, uh, the side by side trainer that you did? The, the spin tunnel model? Yeah, the one that they had. Oh, no, it was, it was about that long. Oh, it was about three feet. Bro. Beautiful <laughs> model. Oh. I, I really wanted to keep it because we painted it all up. They said, no, it's going to stay in at the tunnel. Every airplane from then on was compared to that airplane, and we lost. Is <laughs> another question? Oh, uh, he answered it, actually. Yeah. So. Oh, right. Okay. Other questions? Well, I have to. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Steve. So, have you been acquainted with, I guess I'm going to ask, uh, our, our industrial design? Designers and say mechanical engineers uh, have been acquainted with, with people from both backgrounds and become configurators? I have one configurator, the best one ever was a chicken farmer. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he went to the. <laughs> To now, let, let me give you my opinion because I was asked this when I got the award. Someone said, "What is the most important characteristic of here?" I said, "Be able to sketch. Be able to sketch what you're thinking. Because if you can sketch what you're, and you know how much I sketch, you gave me that program on the back that it's just full of airplane pictures. I mean, I sketch continuously. If you can put on paper what you're thinking, you're already 80 percent of the way there. I mean, you really are. Because if you can visualize it, 3D in your head." You can understand how the pieces go together. Now, I must admit, at this time, everyone depends on computers and cat models, and the skill really isn't there anymore. But I tell you, the, guy, the good configurators, any one of them can sit down and sketch an airplane. So then my question is, all right, so when, when you're going to come up with a design for the stealth mm -hmm. airplane, right? but then you need to know something about the stuff because you oh, yeah. search and come uh, yes. yeah. or if you're going to do supersonic versus subsonic yes. right? so yes. how do you keep up with that type of knowledge base okay. so that your design 
fits to the okay. science. Unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to another story. When I got part of Northrop, I was the only non-Northrop employee working on Y23. And I swear the, the reason they brought me there was so they could tar and feather me. Because all the things we had to do were impossible. For instance, the leading edge in the YF-23 has a deep leading edge, and it's like this long and this thick. And it had to have radar absorbing material. The B-2 was this long, this thick, and we didn't move. I told Yu Ping Lu, the head of RCS, this is what I need to do. And he said, you know, you're crazy. It, it can't be done. So each problem was like, you're crazy. It can't be done. It can't be done. It can't be structure. You know anything about supersonic airplanes? They have to be what's called area rule. You want the least amount of area about the center. That's where everything went. That's where the inlet was. That's where all the internal weapons are. That's where the engines are. So I drew the, the structure was like paper thin, you know. <laughs> so the structures guys came in and my boss said, I want him fired. And if you don't fire him, I want a tar and feather him myself. Uh, actually, we got along very well after that. But the reason was, I said, look, it's got to be paper thin, otherwise the airplane won't super -free. So you have to. Each of these disciplines, especially on a, on a stealthy supersonic airplane, it's all you know, material structures, ram, and they all, they all got to be in harmony. It's very, very good. And by the way, I think the Y23 was probably one of the most beautiful airplanes ever to fly, and it, 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 it was a, it was an effort of aerodynamics, structures, propulsion, materials, RCS, and just, just and weapons. We had designed our own weapons. I mean, we had to put these weapons inside, design weapons with fins all folded, packed in like a little origami thing. Because otherwise, you can't swallow big weapons and superfoods. We had to do our own weapons. It was nuts. I, I even had, I even had, I had, a, I had a guy just doing the cannon and a guy just doing the weapons because we had to integrate a 20 millimeter cannon in the stealth here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. I'll let it. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. All right. Questions? Going on? If not, let's give Mr. Cummings.